Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void were prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. And today, I welcome back my friend, my mentor, my doula, Terry Richmond. I think this is her first fourth podcast episode with me. Clearly, I enjoy talking with her. So in this conversation, Terry and I are talking about how the role of the doula has changed. So Terry has been a doula for 20 plus years, and she has seen the landscape of birth change, how hospital protocols change in the birth culture, as well as how the role and expectations of the doula has evolved throughout her 20 years in the perinatal world. So we're talking, we're going pretty deep into it. It's a really fun, interesting conversation. I think this is going to benefit both those that are pregnant as well as birth workers. I think Terry has some really wonderful insight that I'm very excited for you to hear. Let me tell you a little bit about Terry in case you haven't listened to her other three episodes. So Terry is a labor support doula and certified childbirth educator. For the last 20 years, she has been attending births. And I think she said her number of births is over 900. So she's been to a lot and teaching childbirth education, preparation classes with passion and joy, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of births and countless classes later, she feels strongly that new parents deserve unconditional support and encouragement, no matter what their birth choices are. Terry is the co-founder of Birthday Presents, helped to create a volunteer doula program at Bellevue Hospital Birth Center and served as co-director of the Metropolitan Doula Group and served on the board of Choices in Childbirth. Terry, along with her doula partner, Catherine Stewart Lindley, run Labor of Love Doula Services. So that's a little bit about Terry. We'll go even more into her background and our conversation. Before we get to that, I just want to give some background of what's going on at PYC. So I'm recording this in mid-September and we just started some more in-person classes. So we now have in-person classes I think six days a week. We still don't have them on Sundays yet, but we also have online classes seven days a week. So no matter where you are in the world, you can have support through prenatal yoga classes, through our postnatal classes, through our childbirth ed, our on-demand workshops. We are a one-stop shop to support you. So I'm really excited for you to check all that out. So you can look at our website, prenatalyogacenter.com and see what class best fits you, fits your schedule. While you're on our website, feel free to grab a free downloadable. It's called Five Simple Solutions to the Most Common Pregnancy Pains. And I know I have to change the title and just say most common perinatal pains because these can also apply to postpartum. I know your backs hurt, your necks hurt, holding a baby, feeding a baby, wearing a baby. Ooh, it does a lot on the body. So grab that. And then the last thing I want to mention, and people have really been taking me up on this and I'm doing my darndest to fulfill your requests. If you have a podcast topic, I haven't done or you want me to do again, or maybe you have a different perspective, let me know and I'll find an expert to speak on that topic. So you can reach me, reach me directly at deb at prenatalyogacenter.com. I will get that, I will address it, and I will do my best to get that episode to you. And then I know that said that was the last thing. <laughs> Clearly, I lied. All right. If you're listening to this and you're enjoying the podcast, take a moment, 
pause, leave a rating and review, hopefully five stars. It helps people find us. And the purpose of this podcast is to support. And the more people that find it, the more support we get out there. All right. That is enough of me. So we'll take a moment. And when we come back, please enjoy my conversation with Terry. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Terry, oh my gosh, how excited am I to talk to you again and again? <laughs> Well, about as excited as I am to talk to you. So I think this is possibly our fourth or maybe even fifth podcast. I still remember the first one we did in your apartment. I think it was like 80 something street. And like we had the the computer and the microphone balance and a desk. We're both like speaking into the microphone. And I'm thinking, I don't know what she's doing, but whatever. Deb wants to do it. I trust her. Somebody's going to listen to this, you know, and they the other one times. that jumps to mind is I really need to listen to it again. We, you interviewed me early in COVID when it was like, what's happening? And I, yes. I, I'm curious now to hear it because we were so frantic. Um, I wonder now what that as a little uh, time capsule. I'll have yeah, to you should one. listen because we're definitely going to talk about how things have changed. So, okay, listener friends, yes. today we're talking about how has the role of the doula changed? And Terry, and I'll give her whole bio in the intro, but Terry's background as a doula. Was it 20 years? 22? 20 years. It was 20 20 years. years, Two months ago. Yeah. That's right. And that's when PYC hit its 20 year birthday. I forgot we started around the same time. Mm -hmm. So you've done 20 years as doula in New York City. How many births? You know, I'm not a very meticulous record keeper, but it's well over 900. All right. So a lot of births. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And what's interesting is we can use your lens because not only have you been a doula for 20 years, you've been the mentor to myself as a doula and many other people. So what I'm excited to dive into is how has the role of the doula changed for you as a doula, but also for what the expectations are from the, from the client Mm -hmm. and how how have things changed in the birth world and through the pandemic? So we got a lot to go over, but before I guess mm-hmm. I know you, I know you very well. You were you know, full transparency. You were my, my mentor as a doula. You backed me up. You were the doula for both my kids. So I know you well, but for those that haven't listened to your whole portfolio of, of podcasts with me so far, why don't you just tell people a little bit about you and how you got into the birth world? Um, Sure. So I was um, an actress. I was on Broadway when I got pregnant with my son, who is now 22 years old. (laughs) And I was like a groovy chick from Vermont. And I thought, oh, I want to have a natural birth because that's what groovy girls from Vermont do. But I really was astonished by how little I knew and how I was a grown up. And I was purposefully happily on uh pregnant and 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 I started kind of uh understanding the system in which we birth in America and uh I found it astonishing and and eye-opening and and worrisome and all of the things right and of course I had all the anxieties pregnant people have which led to a deep deep interest and and having my own experiences of birth not having um doula care you know it led to me coming out of that being wanting to be even more engaged, wanting to um, lecture to everyone I knew who would listen. <laughs> um, so I took a training and I learned childbirth education and I thought, well, you know, I'm an actress. I don't have work. I may as well like do something I'm really passionate about as a day job. Maybe I'll teach. Oh, maybe I'll go to this doula training and maybe, you know, I'll do some doula births. I'll do some births and then have a show. And, you know, of course, whatever. I went to the doula training. I met Deborah Pascali Bonaro, who a lot of you would know. And I just never looked back. I I couldn't believe people would let me attend their births. And I, uh, you know, founded a company and we did all that. And I I basically just been a doula full time since that day. And that was over 20 years ago now. And what was so incredible, I think, about the journey from, oh, I, I get it. Birth is supposed to be this to becoming a doula was understanding that everybody is going to do it differently and that it is my job to support 
everybody in their goals for their birth, right? Mm -hmm. That my job was never, ever to be, I'm going to tell somebody how to give birth. And that still remains a really huge, I think, very vital, important part of the conversation as we go forward as doulas um, these days. I 100% agree. And I feel that I feel fortunate that you instilled that in me very early on that it is not for us to tell people how to birth. Like I had my births on my term, but those are mine. And that is not for me. My job is to hold the space for other people to get curious and to see what's right for them. But that's not always the case. So we can dive deeper into that. So, all right. So we've established that you've been doing this forever and that you've done over 900 births. That's crazy. So think about your experience of 20 plus years of attending birth. I want to focus today's conversation on how the role of the duel has changed, but that is so intertwined with how birth has changed Uh and the kind of support people may need or be expecting. So can you share a bit of an overview of the landscape? This is a big ask. (laughs) A landscape of birth from the early 2000s when you started and how you supported clients then Mm -hmm. and how you support them now, as well as some of the changes in the birth culture, because you've been in the hospital system for a long time. Even the short 10 year Mm -hmm. stint that I did, I saw (laughs) protocol changes Mm -hmm. and, and also then, so go, there you go. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, obviously just to let myself off the hook, it it is tricky. I think to talk about all of it because it is evolving as we speak, right? But I will yes. do my best. I think there's some themes I can pull out for sure, right? I will say that when I began as a doula, I was hired by people predominantly birthing in a hospital or birth center who wanted an unmedicated birth. That's why they hired doulas back then. And of course, we did some home births too. Um, we did wherever we were asked to go. But the people seeking us out were wanting an unmedicated birth predominantly, mm-hmm. right? And that started to shift. It had a lot to do with business being born. It had a lot to do with just the, uh, you know, awareness of doulas. Um, and it has shifted very, very much to people hire us for every aspect, right? People hire us for scheduled cesareans because they know we can help them around that experience. People are certainly have for many years been hiring me saying, I want to have an epidural. Is that okay? Right. Um, so people are then shifted to hiring, I think, doulas, unfortunately, but fortunately, often out of anxiety about the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. We have to remember that the vast majority of people are birthing in a hospital and they're scared of the hospital, but they also know that that's where they feel safest. So I think the doula role has really grown up to be not necessarily to help anyone have an unmedicated experience in the hospital, but to people, uh, to help people have the best experience for them, going back to non-judgmental support, helping people to have the best experience for them in a hospital environment, which even with very dedicated, you know, generous caregivers who are great at their jobs or not, um, we're in a very defective system. We're in a very busy system. We're in a system that's ruled by things like money and liability, you know, not your, as a laboring person, not your ideals, right? Um, and so that is a, a huge trend that I've noticed. I get hired for everything and, and everybody, and that's great. I love that. I think, you know, when I started, the doula role also was skewed towards like, oh, I just want to do home births. I don't want to. I've always felt that I had much more to offer in a hospital environment. And, you know, that proves true every time I'm in the hospital. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, protocols have changed some for the better and some definitely not. You know, uh Things as simple as like I used to get yelled at for giving my client like sips of water because they were only allowed ice cubes. And I, I mean, what is water? What do ice cubes turn into? We all agree, <laughs> whatever. They were trying to so limit what women were taking in that we couldn't even let them sip water, you know. And now, though all the studies show we should let women, uh, you know, pregnant uh, people eat, we're at least getting them clears, right? Mm-hmm. There is, you know, Chicken broth and right, uh, jello. Ooh, so you get that. Uh, that's a whole nother discussion, but there is a protocol change. Right. Uh, on the, you know, so great. Um, I also think people have become much more informed and, and, you know, they know what Pitocin is when they head in, right? Um, I think that's all good. I think people are, are getting more information, using more doulas, you know, um, seeking out, uh, care that feels appropriate to them. I think that all is happening at the same time. For me, the biggest trend is going to be that women are, um, 
they're not um, getting to go into spontaneous labor. Our pregnant people are being induced. Um, it'll be interesting when we can really look at the numbers, but there's just no way around it. Induction is, is skyrocketing. And that has to do with a number of factors. It has to do with something called the ARRIVE trial, which is a whole nother discussion. It has to do with COVID too, right? There was a whole kind of taking over of like, okay, everything is scary and we want to control this as much as possible. Over and over, my clients were told, okay, if you test and then come in, everyone's going to treat you better than if you're unknown infection and nobody wants to come in the room. So basically the deal was if you agree to an induction of labor, you know, you'll get better attentive care. And I am sympathetic to all the care providers who took all those risks by giving care. I get it. Right. Um, but Unfortunately, now that we're all feeling safer with COVID, that, that trend has not stopped. On top of the fact that I rarely have any client go past 41 weeks in their pregnancy with a, in a hospital environment, um, there is just such a trend towards getting babies out earlier and earlier. And again, that's a, a big discussion you can have in a, a separate conversation. But what that means for us as doulas, as, you know, where I used to, uh, a, a quarter or a fifth of my population was having inductions. I just finished a few months of work and it was three quarters inductions. And I'm still wow. doing everything I know to do as a doula to get my clients into labor and help that happen and make time to have that happen. And yet um, we're just seeing a lot of inductions. Yeah, I've actually done a fair amount of podcasts recently about induction. So I'll make sure that we link to that in the show notes as well as the arrive trial because that, that was quite the, the upheaval. It, 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 <laughs> it does. Absolutely. So what type of doula are you now compared to when you started? I think. One of the things is my role has hugely expanded and that is just because my experience has expanded. It's because I have a doula partner, Catherine Stewart Lindley, who's a certified nutritionist and a, a genius of, of the pelvis. I mean, you know, you learn things as you go. So mm -hmm. I do think that my role where it began as sort of labor support has become this, you know, much longer, more full, like, um, you know, to the subject of trying to get people into labor. How much am I doing? How much am I supporting that? How many ideas am I having? What are we doing with the optimal fetal positioning? Not something I was talking with clients about 20 years ago because it wasn't the conversation. Mm -hmm. Now it can be the whole conversation, optimal fetal positioning. So I have to be really well versed in that, not just prenatally, but in labor, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more hands-on we're doing very specifically around optimal fetal positioning. Um, there is just my knowledge, I think, has grown around trauma, around anxiety, around those, those things that we're seeing. Um, I think, you know, I obviously, when I was newer, was not as confident in a hospital environment as I became. And part of what's joyful about being a long-term doula is I have long-term relationships with doctors and midwives. And I think that incredibly benefits our clients. And that doesn't mean I ever feel like I can't say what I need to say. It is precisely because I can, but I also have respect for kind of the entire room that we can work in a really collaborative way. And I, you know, repeatedly have doctors say, okay, Tara, you do your thing. I'll be back. Right. And I think that the role of doula becoming normalized in the hospital for the most part has been very, very good, right? For everybody. Um, the nurses also, you know, we have a nurse shortage, so we're dealing with that. And so the doula can really make a difference in the care because the nurses are so busy and they don't have the time and they aren't as present and that's not their fault at all. And, and, you know, that's a huge theme, right? I'm not anti-doctor and I'm not anti-hospital. And I, and that's a big part of, I think, where I come from. Um, there are, staff that you will meet that I wish were never in the profession. But a lot of people are doing their best in a very broken system. And so understanding that, I think, means we can do a lot of pushing back. We can understand why there's all these advocacy that becomes helpful in a hospital environment without saying, oh, the doctor is evil or the nurse is terrible or any of these things, which we don't, that's crazy. We don't want to do that. Right. So I'm going to get back. I'll, I'll come back to something you touched upon, but one thing that re that I really heard you say, and I see is that the role of the doula is not just 
emotional support or even physical support. There's right. so right. much more, so much more involved that right. we can talk about the client expectation in a little bit, but it is yeah. definitely evolved, but I'm curious and I'm going slightly off topic, but yeah. I, <laughs> me go off topic, but as, sure, babe. Uh, as we, as I think about this and I look at your trajectory, look at my trajectory, there was so much more to learn. So when I did my doula training might've been like 2004, like, so it, it was a while ago. Mm-hmm. It was this weekend training. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, go, and I was told, go do three births. And I just yeah. announced to my students, I'm like, who wants me to be their doula for free? I need to learn. And from there, and now I'm doing my spinning babies parent educator. I've been doing, you know, I've done a pelvic floor teacher training. Like I've gathered, I, I was lucky enough to have you as my mentor. Like I gathered a lot of skills mm-hmm. and there's this expectation that doulas should have these skills, but, and this again, maybe opening too much, but who's teaching these skills to the doulas and that in which they're expected to have, do right. you know what I mean? I do. I think it's really tricky. And I also like, I am really, really happy to send my clients to other experts. Like I think, well, I don't, I can identify things, but like, I am not a pelvic floor therapist. Right. So, you know, what I think sometimes my role is to say, right, here are your resources. Right. And, And, and I do that all the time, whether it's, um, a breastfeeding situation that is, uh, oh, are you still there? Yeah. I'm well, a breastfeeding situation that I very quickly can identify as out of the scope of what I can handle. And I can handle a lot, but yeah, I guess let- I'm thinking like during the birth, it's now very much on the doula shoulders. I would think mm-hmm. to be like, mm-hmm. okay, this birth is dysfunctional. Yeah. We need to yeah. reap instead of saying, instead of yeah. the medical yeah. side, which might be like up the pit, up the power. Right. Now the doula can have the keen eye to say, all right, we need to readjust the balance in the body to help mm-hmm. this baby fit through the pelvis. So exactly. there's definitely some skills. I'm going to pull this back. All right. So pulling us back. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what do you find that you're doing differently? Uh, you know, other than more, <laughs> I, I, and, and that's part of, I think the conversation, right? I am from the, you know, very important doula is defined by continuous care. Right. And and that's kind of what I've been coming up against in my career and in kind of the a new wave of doula care and all of that. Um, continuous care means we're not the ones changing shifts. Right. We're the one who was there. And when you do the studies on doula care, it tells us that those create better outcomes than when we have shifts. At the same time, I am, you know, incredibly aware of of the commitment that takes from from someone who wants to work as a doula and what that requires of us and to say nothing of being on call right Mm -hmm. so not only am I saying yeah I'm going to join you in labor as soon as you want help and I'm going to stay no matter what however long it takes until after we meet your baby which I believe is doula care um not only am I saying that but I am uh, you know, on call to leave any event at any time. Right. And so it's a lifestyle to be a doula. And I think, you know, when there was kind of a new wave of trainings that said, Hey, you know, you should offer 10 hours of labor support. And after that, it costs more or this or that, or this or that. I had very strong resistance in my heart to that kind of thing. My thinking is if your client needs you, um, you go, that's the deal. And some of my births are going to be 32 hours and some of my births are going to be an hour. It, it balances up. Right. Um, so what you get is a job that is enormously satisfying, gratifying, amazing and powerful and also incredibly demanding. And you need a lifestyle that fits around it. And, you know, I understand um, that that isn't for everyone. And there are people that could and deserve to be doulas and they're going to have to find other ways to practice. Mm-hmm. I think. For me, then one of those things is partnering. And if you can't go to a birth, you can't go to a birth. Um, for me, I don't see 
um, having shifts, right, in a birth, right? That's just what I cling to as part of how I've always done it. But it's also part of why I think I can't keep doing this forever, right? I come home from a very long birth. And keep in mind, inductions tend to keep us there much, much longer, right? Um, and I, I question that. So I think, you know, one of the things COVID did, right, was have us all take a look like, oh, my God, I've been living a certain way. And so the question comes up, like, is being a doula and what it means by my terms, right? Which is, yeah, I'm going to join you and stay as long as it takes. Is that a livable life? And if it isn't, is there another way to do this and support our clients that really gives them this incredible through line of care? Can we do that in a partnership in a trio? What does that look like? Um, I don't think it looks like arriving later, right? I think that's a tricky thing, but so um, I want to actually keep going me. on this, but we're going to take a <laughs> quick break. And then we're going to come back and let's unpack everything you just said. Okay, we'll be right back. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of the Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play the Godfather, now at chumpacasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group, no purchase necessary. Avoid where prohibited by law. See terms and conditions, 18 plus. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime anywhere with daily bonuses that should brighten your day a little actually a lot so sign up now at chumbacasino.com that's chumbacasino.com no purchase necessary btw void were prohibited by law see terms and conditions 18 plus okay we're back so wow so a lot uh -oh. of what you're uh -oh. saying <laughs> no i love it um because people have asked me like why am i not a doula anymore and i'll be honest i loved the births. It was the, the thing I remember about attending births. It's been my, I was, I remember pumping while being at a birth, which is a long time ago. Time felt like it stood still because I was so focused on my client and hours could pass. I'm like, wow. And then there's other times I'd be falling asleep in a chair and mm -hmm. waking up. I still remember one client. She was, we were both falling asleep between contractions and she woke up. I'm like, breathe in purple. Don't know where that came from, but that's what came out of my mouth. I still remember it, <laughs> but <laughs> she's like, that helped me so much anyway, but it's the lifestyle is very hard. I loved births, but I couldn't do it as a parent who doesn't have a lot of family support around. We have just us. And yeah. you hit on a lot. Some births can take two hours, 22 hours, 42 hours. And, and what I'm hearing you say is how do you do that and sustain a lifestyle? So I'm curious, what are you seeing that other doulas are doing when that maybe you are rethinking? Has someone that's done this for a long time? What are you thinking about partnering? How does one still show up for their clients mm -hmm. while still having their own life. Like I remember going to a wedding with my doula bag, like checked right. in the coat room sure. because sure. I'm like, I'm ready to go if I need to. Like, how yeah. do we find that balance? Yeah. I'm not sure that you do. Right. <laughs> I, I would like to have the answer, but what I have now is more of an open heart to a generation of doulas that are looking for it. Right. Okay. Cause I recognize that the sacrifices I have made have been big, right? Now that my son's grown, I can look back and be like, oh yeah, that birthday party, that performance, that, you know, uh, that wedding where, or that show that I couldn't be comfortable at. And I left at intermission because I was so worried about my second timer. Um, and, and listen, these are trade-offs. I am incredibly blessed to have had so far such a fulfilling career. There are trade-offs. Um, but all that is to say, I think, I don't know the answer. I think it's different for different people, right? What do you really need? For me, what I recognize, I'm just an I'm old dog, right? Like I don't want to do it differently. I don't want to go into shifts. I don't actually, Catherine and I rarely actually full, full, full partner. We often just end up with our clients, but we're there for each other in the background, which is, I think, essential to always know that you have somebody in the background. Um, 
I don't necessarily want to do it differently, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. And I do think it means when people are hiring doulas, they also need to understand, you know, what is being asked of the person they're hiring if they're a solo doula and what they're offering. And that maybe, you know, um, we have a new generation of clients who are really excited to hire two doulas or three doulas and understand that it's going to be great, great through line of care, but not from one person. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, but I have uh, softened my sort of, you know, like for a doula, I can be a little edgy. I think that I was like, this is how you doula. I know better. And I also know that some of that is my privilege, right? I have been incredibly, incredibly fortunate in my career to have plenty of work and, and somehow, you know, raise my son and be head of my household and pull that all off. Um, so I recognize that as privilege too. I think there's a lot of things that need looking at. Um, but I don't, I don't have an answer. I just know for me, I need to do fewer births. That's what, that's how I've solved it, right? I have um, been here a long time. I need to do fewer than I used to. That's how it's working out. And also, especially now that we're doing all these inductions, I had a joke with my doula colleagues. I said, I think I'm going to start doing meet and greets and say, listen, I charge X, but if you happen to have a spontaneous labor, I'll give you a rebate of, you know. <laughs> Because I was just like, oh, these inductions, they're killing me. And you don't want to, you know, you never want people to have added pressure on their birth in any way. Like, oh, if you have an induction, I'll charge you more. You would never, ever do that. I don't think so. Anyway, I don't know. I didn't answer your question, but I don't, I don't have an answer. And I also, I don't think it's for me to answer, right? I do recognize that. I have been doing this a long time and that gives me certain insights, but it also gives me certain um, limitations. And there are a lot of people doing really interesting, amazing things in the doula community that I, you know, have nothing to do with and I'm really impressed by. So, so let's talk about the expectation from the client. Do yeah. you think the expectation has changed in what you saw in the beginning to now? What do you think some of that? Yeah, what is, I was thinking about that because we were talking ahead of time. I was thinking about that. I think it's so varied, you know, and you have to be careful, right? Because I say, hey, if the client wants you to come, you go. There's also all those clients that are still worried more about the doula, their partner than themselves, right? There are those clients where I say, hey, how would you feel if I came over? Because I can tell that I should be there and they're not asking, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it can really, really vary. Sometimes I worry that I get clients that sort of expect me to solve everything and or actually do their labor for them, right? Um, That they're sort of looking to (laughs) have a way to kind of not have to do it, which I understand, right? Some people want a baby. That doesn't mean they want to labor and birth. Um, But, you know, you can't just take information in and do none of it and expect that to create change, right? So sometimes I have clients that expect so little of me. I have to literally like, you know, force information on them, force my help on them, say, I'm going to come over. Is that all right? Would you mind? And then you have people that I think either out of fear or whatever, um, have this expectation that we could fix everything and anything about their concerns or their practice. You know, that's another thing as a, as a long-term doula, you know, I stopped kind of saying, I, I now am very comfortable and have been for a long time. If someone calls me and says, Hey, I don't really like my care provider, but I want to hire a doula. You can help me, right? You can help me stand up to this person. Um, I say, you know, that's not a good strategy. I can't, right? You are, the care is going to be determined by this person that you're already telling me is a bad fit for you that you don't feel safe with. So, you know, trying to empower people ahead of time <laughs> is something that I've done a lot more of in like the second half of my career than I did the first. Um, just be really upfront. I mean, I, again, that's my privilege. I have enough calls. I have enough clients. I don't have to worry about getting each one. I can be really honest. Like, hmm, I have worked with your doctor and this is my experience firsthand. And, you know, I think that you have other options. Now, not everybody has other options wherever they are. But in New York, we have a lot of other options. So that is a big part of what I do as a doula. And if if we do need to stay with that care provider, then it's empowering the client to talk with them ahead of time, not expect that the doula can fix everything in the moment. And any doula that's saying she can fix everything in the moment, oh, don't worry, we'll just do this. Or any childbirth education that says, oh, don't worry, you'll just do this. I think that's naive, Mm -hmm. right? 
And I like what you're saying as well about doing, having that conversation ahead of time, Hmm. because that's when you may be able to iron out some of these differences of kind of point of view, because in labor, we know that we don't want this hyped up energy and this defensiveness. That's not going to help labor function well. That's just going to kind of sink things. So I think having the doula, again, not try to fight the fight. I always think about like, I'm not, I don't show up with my big red cape and I'm like, I'm superwoman. Like that's Um, not the role. Although I do think that's expected at times, but the doula can be encouraging to say, all right, for whatever reason, this is who your care provider is. You know, maybe Maybe it's an insurance or maybe it's, there's just no one else in the area. Right. So let's highlight some of the things that we do differ and see where we can come to a middle ground. Right. I think the doula right. can definitely do that. And oh, a lot yeah. of the language of that, because again, yeah, no, I'm not interfering with care. At the same time, I really want to free up the laboring person to just be in labor, right? Yeah. So either funneling stuff through the partner or... And or doing a lot of nodding my head. Do you guys want a little time to think about this? <laughs> or, you know, oh, doctor, I think they're really curious about the possible negative effects of the procedure you're recommending, right? Could we talk a little more? I know they have some fear about X. Like I can absolutely facilitate a conversation without saying they don't want Pitocin, get out of here, right? Like that will get a doula ejected and it is inappropriate and, you know, right? But there are ways to say, I think that they're really worried about what Pitocin will mean. Can you talk a little more about how you titrate it, right? And just facilitate the conversation because part of the problem, at least here in the city, is the very, very, very busy staff, right? Mm-hmm. And they forget that that um, pregnant people, laboring people are not taking in information in the same way, right? right. They forget. And so... I think my role in those, all that whole avenue is facilitating the conversation, facilitating the information as opposed to hardcore advocacy. That's, I can't do that. Right. right. That's inappropriate. So what do you think about also the expectation of the client when we start to think about some of the hands on work, like, and I've gotten very interested ever since the birth of my son, what's he 11? He's 11. Can you believe it? Oh my um, God. Yes. <laughs> that was a long one. Um, when he was asynclitic and we had to massively readjust. So that was something that you learn through time and I learned through time, but I got really interested in spinning babies. So I've mm-hmm. had the privilege to do a lot of that work and I've talked to Gail multiple times, but there, I do feel like there's often an expectation from the client be like, okay, if baby's coming down, <laughs> doula knows how to adjust. Right. Right. That is that something being taught though in doula training now, or how does that, how can we find a realistic expectation of what the doula shows up with from what the client may believe. I mean, that's the tricky part, right? Like, I, listen, I'm, I know it's being taught in the doula trainings I know of, which are Deborah's, right? Definitely. And I think that the whole conversation around spinning babies around optimal fetal position is, is pretty well known. But how effective can we truly be is another question, right? And so, and there's so many layers to it. Have we addressed it prenatally? Have we addressed whatever might be going on in the pregnant person's body that is creating this malposition? If we haven't addressed that prenatally, it's going to be a lot harder to address in labor itself. Excuse me, even though there's plenty of ways to address it in labor, we can do all those. It's also important to recognize that, yeah, uh, just because I have training, you have training in spinning babies does not mean I can make every baby come into the perfect position in the pelvis, right? Correct. We have all these things to try, but a lot of times, you know, we're at that point um, where we're that deep in labor and still having a malposition problem. And uh, why? Right. We may not always know. And the other thing I find is like, oh, baby's well lined up. We're good. We're good. What's going on with this labor? Hmm. Oh, our little hand was up by her face. Right. And sure, we do our thing and we try to help that. But usually that's just a little longer, harder, you know, labor, a little longer, harder pushing. And, you know, just getting a baby aligned isn't going to tell us about a compound hand in the way. Right. Um, And certainly there are things we can do to help that, but not necessarily. Right. So, you know, babies also, the other part of this, and you see this if you do enough births, is some babies need to come out OP, you know, backward, you know, back to back with mom. Some babies need to come out in these other positions, right? So there's that layer too, which you learn once you do it enough. Um, yeah, the vast majority want to come out in this one position that we learn about, but 
There's some who, you know, shock us and like, how did you get there? Oh, but they found their way out, you know? So I think it's a big challenge uh, for everybody to remember that we got to be open-minded and humble and we can do everything we can do and help the baby find its way down. And, and, and to me, my job is always to do everything I can think of to do, right? Not to promise a certain outcome, but to help my client know and feel and experience having tried all the things we can try to make that birth easier and simpler, right? Whether that is about epidural or cesarean or whatever. Yes. Babies have a a say in the matter too. That's what I always tell my students. Like (laughs) you can do everything that you think, but then baby also sometimes knows things that we don't know. Sure. And I always say, welcome to parenting, you know, (laughs) sorry, but this is the beginning, right? You're going to make these plans and they are going to change, right? Labor not only demands that we be in the moment and be present, which is great because that's what our babies want and are, but it also introduces this idea that you cannot expect things to always go in the exact way you planned them, Absolutely. right? And, and welcome to parenting. It can still be beautiful and amazing, even though the birth is going to look totally different than you plan it. I mean, I that's think pretty, pretty much always. Like, I think always. it is rare when you have someone like, it is exactly how I imagined because right. Right. yeah, I think that's the exception to the it's rule. It's totally the exception. And I think that's an important thing to recognize as a pregnant person, right? Everybody, you know, you're going to hire a doula and she's going to do everything she can, but there isn't a magic wand by anyone. And if there were, you know, great, I would love it. Right. (laughs) That would be fine. So I'd be- find another job, but so before I shift to a little bit of conversation yeah. about social media content, is there anything else about the role of the doula or the balance mm. between supporting clients and health of the doula? Anything in that world you want to well, keep diving do, into? Yeah, I do think the other big part of this was the experience of going virtual. Yeah, please the share. experience of being on Zoom with our clients, the experience of not physically being with our clients prenatally or in labor or or or. Um, you know, what we learned. What I learned, I I should only speak for myself, but, you know, I can speak for some of my colleagues, too. But what we learned was, like, we can be enormously helpful as virtual doulas, right? Because obviously having someone to turn to and ask questions and we can hear things and see things and and make adjustments. Um, You know, we know we helped people during that time, but we also are well aware of what we couldn't do. Um, and our, our clients weren't, right? Because they had no experience necessarily of a hands-on doula to compare. So for me, you know, the virtual model was incredibly limiting, um, in terms of the birth itself. Um, but the takeaway for me is how much I could reach my clients, you know, without being with them, right? I, even for meet and greets, I used to be like, why aren't we just talking on the phone? Why aren't we meeting? Why aren't we meeting? Um, and I feel what a lot of us took away was, Oh, we're actually in more contact in a lot of ways than we were um, because I'm not thinking it all has to be in person. It also made me realize that, you know, you have to remember there are tons of people who are not going to choose to have a do at their birth. And so the thing I've been really riffing on is I can really help a lot of people that aren't having a do at their birth they're still going to benefit from talking with a doula, from somebody who sees the scope of everything, from somebody who can spend an hour with them and get them sorted and answer those questions and have the perspective that nobody on their team has. And I think that that's something I've been thinking a lot about is like, how do we reach more people, even though we're not going to go on to be their doula, they may not choose to have a doula, they may not feel they can afford a doula, whatever that's going to look like. Um, I, I think there's real value there. And I hadn't really put that somehow together because I I was quite obsessed with this in-person model. Right. But having now helped people all across the country and, and had all these different experiences, you start to recognize, Oh, okay, what else can I do? And how do your doula skills, um, how do they bring value even outside of attending the actual birth? Is that what you're calling birth counseling? That's what I'm calling birth counseling. <laughs> and um, I, I I know people are doing it, but I don't think it's necessarily such a thing. But, it, you know, what I'm finding is, hey, sometimes people just need an hour. You know, they're like desperate to get into labor and they're freaked out or they put their birth plan together, but they have all these questions, you know, like 
or they're just starting out and they don't know where to begin. Those are great times to have an hour with a doula who has that wide scope of knowledge and time and energy. Um, I think another model is, you know, I get a call from somebody who's like, okay, I want my partner and my mother to be at the birth. I only get two people, so I'm not going to have a doula. What can you do for us? And, you know, again, I'm not that excited about the virtual doula, you know, be on your iPad in the moment, but I feel I can be an incredible help to them and they can, you know, we can have sort of a package like, yeah, you can reach out to me whenever you want. You can reach out to me in early labor and I'll answer your questions, but we have all this prep we can do together, all this understanding, all these meetings that I would do and kind of help prepare the family and just be there to guide them because, you know, there's tons of info out there. But that doesn't always help people. They really need it brought back down to their experience in their body and their hopes with their doctor or midwife or whoever they're using. And so that's where I think, again, doulas can really help. I feel like we can bring it back from the Google and the mm-hmm. all of the, all of the, all of the info. Um, Huh. I've been doing birth counseling and I didn't even know it because there I, you go. I, I have we students. Need to, we need to be clear about what we're doing, right? Yeah, no, I, Cause I would have students after class, we'd end up talking for 20, 30 minutes about, yeah. you know, conversations and what they talk to their care provider about or right. how to prep their birth plan. And I'm like, Oh, look at that. I do birth that counseling. is birth counseling. And, <laughs> and look, I bet they leave those conversations and say, Oh my God, I feel so much better. You know, I don't mean to be arrogant in any way, but most of the time when I talk to someone at the end of the call, they go, Oh my God, I feel so much better. That's just because I know I've yeah. done this forever. And why wouldn't we want people to have that? Because I don't think people say that when they go on Google and read a hundred things about whatever they're worrying about. About. I don't think they feel better. I think they feel worse. So, you know, my wish is that we can have more of those conversations. All right. So that is a perfect segue to what can we do about social media content and sorting through it all? <laughs> yeah. And of course I am, it's laughable. that we I, I actually, when you wanted to talk about this, I'm like, Terry wants to talk about social media, the person that has fought it for the last how many years? <laughs> right. And it's, and it's precisely because I fought it again, old dog. Um, I, I, And let me just say that the only reason I'm on is one, a couple of clients really encouraged it. And I saw value that way, but mostly because I have two 25 year old gems, one of whom is the daughter of my best friend, you know, doing it for me, right? Like I can say, here's what I know. And they make it into these nice posts and tell me what to do. Uh, So listen, I feel like I, I know nothing and I've been learning a lot and But why did I think I should be or chose to be should be? Why did I think there was a place for me on Instagram, which is the where we are? Because I have a strong resistance to um, I think it's newness to the field of birth. I don't know. I don't I'm going to I'm trying not I'm trying to be very careful with my words. I believe that we do not help people to have great births by scaring them. Right. I feel really strongly that we are not going to help people's births by giving them scary information. And I see that a lot because we do have a really messed up healthcare system and we have a, a, you know, many, many people are being mistreated in this environment. However, um, I think scaring them more works for maybe a percentage of people, but the bulk of the people that I have worked with over the years are not benefiting from that kind of model, which is if you don't, you know, your doctor's going to, um, I think there has to be um, an approach that is gentler for me. That's, that's how I've always approached it. And I, and I think it has to not be deaf to the fact that, you know, the vast majority of people, uh, who are birthing, especially in a hospital, which is the vast majority of Americans are choosing an epidural. Mm-hmm. Now, are they doing that because, you know, they just had felt no other choice, but they really wanted unmedicated? I, I don't, think so. I think there's a whole mix of why people are choosing epidurals. And I don't think we're going to help people have better births by, you know, demonizing that or their, their desire to have that or their, or their desire to have an induction if that's the right and appropriate thing for them, right? There's nothing scarier to a client than the doctor saying, you have to do this. And then the doula saying, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard, right? We do have to figure out how we work together. Um, unless you want to go off the grid, which people can do. And there's opportunities on social media for that, right? I I think it's tricky, right? There's tons of info on there and some of it's great. I mean, the first thing is don't follow accounts that 
freak you out, right? That's not necessarily helping you towards a better birth. But I, I think also I like when people are doing like live things, when there's conversations, I think conversations are much more helpful. Um, I like that, you know, people can reach a big audience and answer questions live and, and, or video or whatever. I like this, you know, I, I like that we can reach people in a, in a, a broader way than just like, here's a post, here's a statistic, here's a, but obviously that's the way in. And, um, you know, I think how do we make the information accessible to everybody without making it overwhelming? You know, that is not a question that I'm <laughs> capable of answering. And, you know, I question it all the time. Like, is there value in just putting more out there? How are we doing it? And that's something I'm thinking about. Like how, can I, right, can we have conversations with people? Like, I think that's always going to be better. I also want to add about the accuracy. There was a post that I saw recently, a couple of days ago, that I was horrified by. It was showing the delivery, the third stage of labor, the placenta delivery. And mm-hmm. what it showed, it was like an animation that someone was doing fundal pressure at the top. And then you see the care provider's hand go all the way in and scoop oh. the placenta out. Oh. And I, of course... <laughs> I really try not to interject too much. I really try to stay in my own lane, but I'm like, no, this is incorrect. This is not routine protocol. Sometimes there is retained placenta. Sometimes there is reason for that, but this is not routine delivery, delivery of the placenta. I got, I got people saying like, I almost died. My placenta stayed. And I'm like, yes, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but by putting a video showing a hand reaching into a uterus and scooping it out, that is scary for somebody. And does that happen? Yes. But is that the norm? No. So I think we also have to be really mindful of what, just because we see it and maybe even from what one they call a reputable source, it's, you know, take, take another look, like go a little bit deeper. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's really tricky. And I think, I'm glad they made a cartoon of it. <laughs> oh my gosh, we can keep going up. I'm going to have to wrap us up. So we're going to take another break. When we come back, what is one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer a new and expectant parent? So go through your Rolodex in your head of the last Ooh. 20 years of your, <laughs> of your work and pick out one thing. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Okay, so what is that one shiny piece of information you want to share? Thankfully, I I think I have it. Um, I feel it's really, really important that you birth in an environment and with as much as you have control over it, people that make you feel safe, right? So if you feel safe in a hospital, that's where you go. If you feel safe in a birth center, if you feel safe at home, um, that is where you go. And nobody should be telling you to do other than what makes you feel safe. And then the more you can surround yourself where you have a choice of care provider, where you have a choice of a birth partner, obviously, and another person there who is going to make you feel safest, not who most deserves to be there, you know, the Mm -hmm. new grandma or whatever. Um, Sorry, grandmas. Um, But who will make you feel safest and how can you facilitate that? Um, And if you don't feel safe with your care provider, that is not something that will get better on the day of the birth. So anything you can do to address that ahead of time um, is really worth putting the energy in, even if that feels stressful and like a lot of work. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I say that all the time, probably because you probably taught that to me. So <laughs> <laughs> where can people find your work? Um, so Instagram now uh-huh. at Dula Terry, D-O-U-L-A-T-E-R-R-Y, Dula Terry. And then, um, our website, Catherine's and my website is laborlove.org. 
just laborlove.org. That's and, us. Yay. And yay. I actually have, by the time this podcast is released, Catherine's podcast would have already been dropped. Great. Um, I know she did one about where people should birth. And I have to tell you, we talk about where you feel safest quite a bit. Um, so, Shocking. She and was, I agree. Amazing. When um, you're the partnering, what do you know? <laughs> So I'm excited that people are going to get to get this wonderful information. You really so have taught so many people and support so many people in understanding that there is not one right way to birth. There is how they want to birth and they deserve the support to honor that. So thank you for doing that for the community. Thank you for being my mentor for all these years. It's Mm -hmm. always a joy to chat with you. My pleasure, sweetie. And I'll see you soon. Yes. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.